question for you would be, what's the difference? What do you sense there? Is there a new impetus? Is there a new narrative, so to speak, with regards to this particular summit compared to the previous one? And remember, you can ask questions in the chat, but now over to you, Begide. Thanks a lot. And, and thank you very much for, for this invitation, which is, uh, I've really been looking forward to have this discussion. Please let me know if the sound starts to get, uh, if we have problems, because then I turn off the video. We, I'm used to that. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I think your headline is spot on. It is, uh, well, what I can say, my headline is, it's not same procedure as in 2017. Uh, there is a new impetus, and and I just want to to frame a little bit. Yes, I was in Abidjan in 2017. At that time, I was a EU Africa director in Brussels, um, and and travelled and was part of the of the negotiations from from that angle. Um, what is most? I can give a small example. I mean, um, at the closing ceremony in Abidjan. Uh, we had a very, it was very unusual. And when you're a diplomat and say it's unusual, it is really unusual. Um, uh, we had not finished uh, to negotiate the, uh, the declaration. Um, and, and suddenly the African Union uh, chair, who was Alpha Conde, the president from, from Guinea Conakry, he, uh, he, he you know, he said, well, and now the declaration has been agreed, and then he distributed it in the room, and uh, Donald Tusk, the, uh, the European president, he was there. Uh, we sp stood behind him and we said, no, 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 you have to do a timeout, we've not seen that declaration. Um, and, and he, I don't think Donald Tusk had ever been in a situation like that, but he did, and he said, I think we have to have a look at the declaration. And then some of us tried to translate between Ton and Tusk, who didn't speak French, and Alpha Conde, who didn't speak English. And there was, anyway, the, the, the unusual thing here was, um, although that we had had a ministerial, we'd had a senior official meeting, and when we went to the leaders, uh, we still had some outstanding issues. It was 2017 was a year, only two years after Lampedusa incident with all the migrations. Just before the summit, we had the CNN had uh, had had a, a, a program about stranded mi African migrants in Libya. So, so this was one of the key issues, and this was also why we couldn't close the text in that in that closing uh, because we hadn't agreed on the migration language. I'll not go into all the details, but it was it was quite an unusual and and it was quite um, a special um, a, a special setting so now we're going to do it differently in preparations we have a, i want to share with you three uh, main lessons learned that we took from from abidjan before i go into what we're doing right now one first thing is make sure that leaders engage in real talks because to create a real ambitious partnership we need African and European leaders to talk and to engage directly. We need to go beyond speeches. We need to create a summit where they can actually talk and a process up to so that we, for instance, don't end in, in awkward situation. The second is to reach that, we need to do a lot of outreach ahead of the summit so that everyone is briefed. Um, all countries are briefed about what what uh, what is on the agenda, and the third one. This is my takeaway um, and what I have learned over the years. I think to get to a new place, we have to focus on where we agree, where we have real uh, win-win opportunities, um, because we have some areas. I just we can come back to discuss some one of them or some of them, but there are really areas where we have a lot in common. So this was just to say, Abidjan 2017, what are we looking at Brussels uh, 2022? And as you said, Luke, I did before I was, uh, my, my system switched off, I did hear that you say, we've been waiting a bit um, for this summit. And I have myself also been preparing it for a few years now because of the COVID, it has been postponed. But we're looking at some very fundamental issues. Um, to have a new type of summit. First of all, there has been a lot of outreach. There has been a lot of discussions already between leaders. 
Some of you will know that for Ursula von der Leyen, her relationship or the Commission relationship with the, with the African Union was so important that it was the first place she traveled before she traveled to other big cities in the world. She actually went here to Addis Ababa. But Charles Michel, who you know is the president of the council, he has really been uh, also traveling to Africa. He's been inviting African leaders because we want something different. We want, we want a more ambitious, we want a different type of partnership. So, so this has been quite important. So we want to, at the moment, we're looking at um, another type of declaration, another very political declaration. We will start negotiations hopefully next week when the African have had their summit because they are in the midst of their own summit right now. Um, and that's a very uh, short uh, declaration, at least at the moment. We call it very political, forward-looking. It is um, what, and it's us, the European, we've been pen holders. Um, so what we, it's a bit, it's different than other declarations. Um, it starts, and, and the ambition is to have a shared vision between the two continents. And I think that's, that's really important. Again, what is it we share? What is it we have in common? Of course, there will be issues of health, the whole response to the COVID-19. Um, EU has really uh, been, what I call, we have engaged in a 360 approach, which means, yes, we have, when we could, we delivered masks. It was, there was a bit of a situation. Um, we have been delivering um, also, um, funds to, to do research, to do institutional cooperation, and we've held on the special drawing rights to build up economies. So we have moved there, and right now we are investing in actually vaccine productions in Africa. So that, that is going to be a big issue, and I think that EU and Africa, we have something to showcase there. There will also be, I think, research innovation. There will be um, this will the global gateway uh, will be quite important. The, the big launch that, that we did from the European Union side um, from the Commission in December, where we promised to mobilize 300 billion euro for, for investments. And this is exactly also meeting what we've heard from the African leaders. They want to see EU back to invest in infrastructure in a broad sense. Um, so this is a bit on the on the substance of, of what we're going to negotiate. There is also a new way. It's not same procedure in terms of how we are organizing the summit. So because those of you who were, some might have been in meetings or so on, where you know formally you can have each leader have two or three minutes interventions. If you bring if European and African leaders together, you have more than 80, 80. And that is uh, not so interactive and not framing the dialogue that I said we wanted. So what we have set up is, uh, and the African side have, have accepted it, that we do seven roundtables where leaders can engage in these issues, infrastructure, investments in health, peace and security. And, and that's, of course, very innovative. So we're still working on which countries will lead what and so on and so forth. But it is going to be exactly not same procedure, but to try to have uh, real dialogues between our, our leaders. Another thing I will say um, is also there is a lot of focus on deliverables. So um, it's a short declaration. We think, as I said, we haven't started negotiations. It always gets a little bit longer once you start negotiations. Um, but, um, but we are really focusing on, on what we can deliver in our partnerships. And I think the big investments and the Global Gateway would be an, an important instrument, but there will also be others. Um, if I then, just to give you a bit of the flavor of what we think and what we have picked up would be the issues to be discussed, because um, uh, we have been here in Addis, some of our job, one of our important jobs in preparing a uh, summit like this is to reach out to the commissioners here and say what do you think about this and, and what are your visions and so on. We know that the Green Deal that we want uh, and that we have launched, that raises eyebrows because for the Africans, um, they say this is a European Green Deal, we want more transition. So the word green transitions will be extremely important. 
if we are to find what I said first, find where we have uh, uh, views in common. Another big issue um, because of the timing will also be, you know, of the WTO discussion. The whole issue of the trips, the whole issue of uh, property rights and so on uh, is an issue. So we will see how far we, we can go um, in terms of, of getting some, some language right there. Um, there is also on peace and security, I want to draw your attention to, there is a new um, European peace facility, which was launched last year. If we look at how much we as European Union are investing in peace and security, we are by far the largest, um, the largest supporter of, of the African peace and security architecture. Um, I'm sure we will, if we don't uh, get some, we are right now trying to, to work on a new set of, of AMISOM, which is the largest force uh, peace uh, support operation of the African Union in AMISOM, no, in Somalia, it's called AMISOM. Um, another thing for sure, I think will come up on the peace and security will be how the whole situation in the Sahel and in West Africa. We have the Danish cis case of uh, just uh, being asked to leave Mali. I saw just a French ambassador yesterday was asked to leave Mali within 72 hours. Um, but, but what is at stake here is uh, and, and that's also something that worries African leaders is um, peace and security and what we call the unconstitution, you know, changes of government. I mean, how the African Union actually suspend these countries that have attempts of coup d'etat or have coup d'etat. So Mali will not be at the summit, Burkina Faso will not be at the summit, Guinea will not be at the summit, Sudan will not be at the summit. We've never seen this this situation uh, on the African continent before. So I think this will also be uh, something that we will we will discuss when we would discuss peace and, peace and security, but also the governance part of it, which is very much also from, from the EU agenda. I already mentioned the global gateway that will be uh, with the 300 billion that will be mobilized, not of course only to Africa, this is a global initiative, but Africa is the first geographical a continent where we will discuss how will we invest and using the financing arms also of the European Investment Bank and of the other funds available. I will end by just a few numbers because they count and facts, uh, because sometimes uh, there are many floating figures and I like figures to, to describe things. The first one I will say is that in 2020, the EU 27, were the largest trading partner with Africa, about 30% of the import, 30% of the export. Um, another thing is um, related to how much uh, we are quite a big financer of the African Union. Um, at the moment, we are actually financing 40% of the budget of the African Union. So, so that's, that's quite a lot. And on peace and security operations, we have actually invested over well, since 2007, 3.6 billion euro. So this is, um, uh, it's, a, it's a big business and um, that's also why we here at the delegation, we are almost 60 people uh, with 33 um, Europeans and of course many uh, Ethiopians as we are in Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, that are specialists on, on all the various fires that we cover, covering, um, all issues from, from human development, health, um, education, um, what I mentioned on green and digital, and uh, to migration and, and mobility and peace and security. I'll stop there. These, these issues will also feed into the summit. And um, we are formally, and what is important about a summit is that that gives us the strategic framework that will guide us until the next summit. Thank you very much. Excellent, Birgitte. And there was no need for any digital surgery there. That was loud and clear. Uh, we are just about to, to move on, um, but I just wanted to hear whether uh, our Minister Fleming, whether you had any comments, I mean, possibly also on your sort of optimism. Uh, you mentioned that the timing for this summit was, was a good one. Um, 
But then I could also hear Birgitte saying, well, there are also some, well, I know that from the press as well, some incidents happening also with regards to Mali and so forth. So, so are you also maybe slightly worried that some of these more uh, issues regarding security, sort of great politics could, could have an impact, negative impact upon the summit? How do you look upon that? Over to you, over to Berlin. <laughs> thank you. And thank you very much to two others. It's really interesting. Yes, and I think it's really a very, very, very timely um, uh, summit that we are looking into. But also, I agree that, uh, and that was also what I said, that our second priority is uh, peace and security. It's really, it's really, a lot of things are frightening me just now, but we have to be hopeful and we have to, to believe that uh, we can change. So we are going to focus here supporting peace building and stabilization efforts in Africa. And here we focus on Sahel, Gulf of Guinea and Horn of Africa, and also conflict prevention and preventing violent extremism, because that's what is really frightening a lot of people in, uh, in Africa just now. And that's also one of the reasons to the very big migration and to that the number of UNHCR that uh, about uh, 85 million people are, are refugees or they are internally displaced just now. So, of course, this is a very critical situation. Thank you. Excellent. I think what we'll do is that we'll move on. I think this was a very good sort of first part uh, of our webinar. And particularly also thank you uh, to, to ECFR for joining our minister and Birgitte. Uh, we will remember uh, your, your sound bites there. Uh, let's ban speeches and uh, it will not be same procedure as uh, last time. So with that, it's going to be very interesting for us to follow also whether this then creates a completely new dynamic. Uh, all the best to, to Fleming Müller Mort and take care out there in Berlin. Uh, we move on now to our next speaker, to Katharina Sørensen, who is Deputy Director here at Think Tank Europa. And among many of Katharina's talents is to be very sort of good at asking the right questions and figuring out what do they think about the European Union and international affairs. So we thought it would be extremely relevant to ask questions about what do Danes, the Danish public, think about Africa now that we have the African EU summit coming up. So over to you, Katerina. The floor is yours. Thanks very much, Lüge. And I hope uh, you can see the slides that present. Indeed. And I hope I am now unmuted again. It muted automatically. Uh, so I think that might have happened before as well. But um, I just, um, we've already heard um, that in the Danish new foreign policy strategy uh, was presented recently. And in connection with that presentation, our Prime Minister Mette Frederiksen said that it would be good if each and every Dane could start to think a little bit more about the world we are facing, how we relate to that world. And we couldn't agree more here at Think Tank Europa. We have a, our unofficial motto, which is mind the gap between what is happening in Europe and the rest of the world and what's then how it's affecting Denmark. So exactly as Lukas said, that's how we sent out. Uh, we set out together with the uh, Grundfest Funden to do our own little probe into what um, immediate reflections and thoughts uh, the Danes have when they're asked about Africa, both as the continent as a whole, but also ranked and compared to the other continents uh, on this planet. And we want to share a few of the findings uh, with you here today. The survey was carried out just last week by Vox Media, and it has uh, 2,000 respondents. And starting here with the basics. So what continents do we know best here in Denmark? This, tri this uh, slide tries to illustrate just that. Um, I think it will document what most of you already think and feel we don't know Africa very well. So we asked respondents to rank the six main continents uh, in the world according to which they know best. And for this illustration, we then grouped the first, second and third priority together. And it's no surprise at all that Europe comes first, North America, and I think also not a big surprise that Asia uh, gets third prize. But uh, I think the surprising thing here, or at least the striking thing in terms of how we develop the relationship with Africa, obviously, is the huge gap between 
for instance, the 50 percent percentage points drop in our knowledge when it comes to North America and then when it comes to, to Africa. At the same time, um, many of us have a strong feeling that cooperation with Africa will become more important if we look over the course of the next 10 years. 63% um, of the respondents say that Africa, cooperation with Africa uh, and Europe will become more important in the next 10 years. Uh, only 4% say it will become less important. And that's quite a lot more than people who think that the cooperation with the states will become more important over the same time period. So it's coming more and more on our radar. And I think maybe this reflects some of the dynamics we heard the previous speakers uh, highlight. Maybe it reflects uh, the reactions to some of the huge uh, geopolitical um, earthquakes we see in the world today. Um, as this figure that I have uh, highlighted here, as this um, tries to to reflect uh, we the, the respondents uh, from our from from Denmark here certainly don't don't feel comfortable with with a power like China playing a, a huge role in in Africa it says uh, the question was uh, China invests massively in Africa um, what, what what statement do you agree with the most and here a majority says it's a problem for Europe and uh, a lot of people also say that um, Europe should invest more in Africa. This uh, sense, when we think about China in in uh, China's role in Africa, that doesn't somehow uh, spo um, boil over to us having Africa as a continent on the radar when it comes to most important trade relations. So in this map, we uh, we asked respondents to uh, who are the most important continents when it comes to to uh, Denmark's uh, trade relations to develop and uh, Africa uh, very close to South America and uh, Oceania uh, is bottom of the list here. It's quite a different picture when it comes to the same question but with migration as the main theme. Uh, here, Africa is actually second in terms of the most important continent for us to cooperate with in handling um, migration. Um, and I think this uh, reflects quite well the priorities we have for Denmark's relationship with Africa as a whole. Here we asked uh, what areas should be in focus and refugees or migration definitely top the list. About half the respondents highlight this as a main priority area for Denmark. We also heard it was on the minister's list just before. The second one is very much still a very donor uh, relationship focus on poverty uh, reduction. And then education comes in as a third. And um, I think it was, uh, if you look at the bottom of this list, it was in quite stark contrast to what many of the speakers before were reflecting in terms of what can we do now and what should the summit focus on? We heard about the global gateway focusing on infrastructure. That's not that's quite far down on this list. Uh, also something like digitization, um, the huge opportunities that would be for Danish companies in this respect. That's very much off the radar among uh, the Danes as such. Innovation also very low on this list of priority areas. My final slide that I wanted to share with you uh, today is about our feelings towards uh, Africa, but also uh, towards um, the European Union, which uh, in, at least for many years in Denmark has been quite a contested uh, relationship. But there's really stark contrast in the responses uh, that you see on your screen here. So um, I think it's and also in, we heard the, the balancing act that that the uh, that the speakers before were talking about. Is it a story of optimism? It is it a story of challenges. And I think in 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 the uh, minds of many Danes, it's it's the challenges and it's the worries uh, that that dominate when in terms of emotions when you think about Africa. So resignation, sadness, pessimism, all the top three uh, immediate emotions that people associate when they hear about Africa are in the negative camp of of emotions. And quite in contrast uh, with the European Union here, hope optimism, uh, resignation, 
as a, as a third, it's still a negative feeling, but still the two dominant feelings are clearly um, more in the positive camp. So um, I hope this gives uh, a few, give a few uh, ideas for, for the discussion that will come. And uh, we will we have um, many more questions from the survey. We will develop them. We have a we'll do some stories with the Danish daily Kristi Daublad ahead of the upcoming summit. So you'll hear more about this, Paul, if you're interested. And also after those uh, that feature, we will also put the slides on our on our website. But thank you very much for for your attention. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much also for sticking, I mean, to our time schedule because we are moving on now to our final panel and uh, one can also follow the chat here. Uh, ECFR has been very active in answering questions, so uh, doing a better job than I am sort of in, in making sure that, that you get uh, answers to your questions. But but let, let's keep them coming and let's see whether we, we manage uh, to, to also to answer some of them online here. But we move on now because we move on to our second panel and what we'll focus upon here is more specifically the EU summit and particularly the uh, hopes uh, for Denmark, the visions for Denmark, wh what can Denmark do both together with Africa, but in particular also through the European Union. And as you remember, when I introduced the minister, I said that it's uh, now part of the uh, Danish new foreign policy and security strategy that uh, the Danish government wants to have a more active European Union in Africa. So the question is obviously what areas we already heard some of them uh, are we thinking about and how could that be done in practice. So let's uh, have our our first speaker and our first speaker comes from a business from Danish business. It's a uh, Pia Jesuka Rask. You are director at uh, Grundfos Safe Water. So what are what is your take on the, the summit and obviously also on the overall EU African relationship? The floor is yours. Over to you. Thank you so much. And I just want to make sure you can hear me. Since, we uh, can. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for the invitation and this opportunity to speak. Uh, it's, it's a big topic to cover in three minutes, but but I'll, I'll obviously uh, do my best. Um, I'm super happy to, to share my thoughts from a private sector perspective, at least from where I'm sitting. And, and giving it three minutes, I sort of gave it a heading called local opportunity. Um, I think it's fantastic, first of all, the private sector is given a role, which I think has been growing these past years, also with the sustainable development goals and, and certainly also with the, the new strategy from the EU that highlights private sector investments into Africa as well. So, uh, so I think that is uh, excellent news and, and uh, very exciting for private sector. I was asked to reflect on how can we prioritize our engagement in, in Africa, and I gave it some thought and, and actually decided maybe that's the wrong question. <laughs> maybe the question is, um, what do our African business partners, partners need to grow in their own markets? Um, you know, private sector is, is very, very simple. Uh, private sector will go where there's good business to be made. Uh, we're, we're not uh, complex animals like that. If we don't make a profit, we go out of business, we cannot deliver goods, we cannot deliver services, we cannot create jobs. It's, it's, it's quite simple like that. And we do business with our African partners exactly the same way or roughly the same way as we do with our European partners uh, in that sense. We grow together. That's how, uh, that's how private sector works. It's, it, uh, we, we, we always work in win-win with, with our customers. Um, that said, you know, there is an opportunity to grow in Africa. It is a, a home to the fastest growing population. And we often hear of these big opportunities also that came out around the sustainable development goals when uh, we were trying to show how we can monetize on that um, from the from the both from the EU and UN side and also from Denmark's side. Um, I think the challenge with that is that we often end up looking at a very long time horizon, 2040, 2050. You know, yeah. and most companies don't even survive that long. Uh, in 1958, most big companies would survive around 60 years. And now 50 years later, it's less than 20. So we are looking at investment horizons where we often talk in 20, 30, 40 years into the future. And most companies will not even exist by then. So that, that is a very tough decision to make, to look at this very long uh, horizon when it comes to making business investments. So I think some, some of what we need to discuss is maybe the horizon when you're talking uh, to businesses um, around investments in Africa. 
The other word I, I wrote down is predictability. Uh, we really love predictability. Um, you know, what, what some are calling the great power competition or, you know, you are calling the geopolitical approach <laughs> is not necessarily something that uh, increases predictability. Uh, I can certainly recognize the competition in this because it is reflecting what we also experience, of course, competition in the market with companies from other places uh, around the globe uh, and also particularly from India, China and other uh, rising indus industrial nations. Um, so the question for me, at least uh, as a private sector um, person, is more, is there a level playing field? You know, competition is not bad. I believe in open markets, but is it a level playing field when we go into Africa? So I think that that's the big question where I see EU can certainly play uh, a role. Um, another area I focused on was uh, was development, because we often couple this uh, business uh, private sector approach to development. And um, my reflection was that businesses are not democratic organizations. I, I don't think we're supposed to be either. And democracy is not really a prerequisite for doing business if you look at it, uh, you know, in a, in a silo. So it is a tricky balance when you start coupling, you know, development, social development with private business participation, because how far does responsibility of the private sector go in this regards? And, and I just want to give an example. So we are doing a public private partnership in Ghana, rehabilitating these small uh, scale water systems. So not big ticket that, that we often hear about where you can also find funding from different places. This is rehabilitating small scale water systems with local authorities. So we did a human rights assessment of the first site. That human rights assessment cost the same as the initial investment in the water system itself. So what do we do now? You know, we have an ambition to do 100 by 2025. And if I have to do a human rights assessment every time we open a new site, there is no business case. It's gone. So how do we deal with that? Because we actually really want to do good. And it would be very bad to do bad when we're trying to do good. But how do we balance this? Because there's no business case if we need to do something like um, a human rights assessment every time. And we're just not used to dealing with these high levels of unpredictability because that's also unpredictability that we are not sure of our social impact. Because as a Danish company, we, of course, would like to have order in that house. Um, our African partners are. They are very used to operating in unpredictability. They're very used to operating in this complex environment that I think many of, uh, of our participants here have described. So again, going back to what we need, we need opportunities for our African business partners to sustainably grow. And their challenges are very much you know, around affordable financing. It's about corruption. It's around supply chain complexities, cross-border trading, property rights, you know, all the other areas that ha has actually been mentioned here. And, and I think this is where the EU uh, Africa partnership can have some value, you know, in this enabling framework conditions um, around the ease of doing business. And for the for the Danish government, of course, that's the shorter term. Long term, of course, peace and security is, is the foundation for for uh, for predictability. For the Danish government, I think something that uh, that that the, the honorable minister also brought up is focus and it's building uh, deep sector insights and relationships in specific sectors where we have business strengths and know-how, like water, uh, that's also, by the way, uh, thoroughly regulated typically. So this public-public uh, collaboration can become quite important. And that can really simplify our ability to, to engage and grow uh, locally as well. So, so I think there's huge opportunity for, uh, for public-private sector and the EU and the Danish engagement in Africa to, to really start paving the way for um, for African and, and European partnerships to grow together. Excellent. Thank you very much, Pia. And also well done in uh, answering your own questions. That is also sometimes <laughs> a, a tactic that I try to use. We move now on to uh, Fleming Conradsen, professor at the University of Copenhagen. Um, I think that all Danes on this call have seen Fleming on television all the time, trying to sort of make the point that this pandemic that we are facing is not a Danish one, it's not a European one, it's not an African one, it's a common one and we need to find common solutions uh, to combat the pandemic. You can speak on many, many topics, Fleming, but I'm sure that there will also be just a little aspect of health. But thank you very much for being with us and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And, and speaking as a university uh, person here, Obviously, I would like to emphasize the need for investment in, 
in knowledge systems, uh, human resources, and, and building the infrastructure for the future in terms of research and technology. We have seen in Europe, um, early on European Union, and still, of course, investing massively of, of government funding into research infrastructure, support for facilitating research calls, and so on and so, so forth. And I think we have to start viewing our collaboration with Africa as much more of a knowledge uh, collaboration. Obviously, there are many sectors, and <clears throat> Pia just pointed towards water, lots of opportunities for private sector within certain frameworks, but we also have to opt our investment and engagement in knowledge. And it's moving away from viewing Africa as a place with lots of resources and lots of opportunities given the expanding population and so on, Africa also have to be viewed as lots and lots of bright brains. Um, it's the youngest continent, lots of opportunities for develop technologies that are not transferred, but have a starting point in problems identified locally and solutions developed locally. So I, I, I would love to see an upfront European Union approach that clearly acknowledges the need of recognition of, of building knowledge infrastructure in Africa. And it's not us building it, but it's finding ways of facilitating that structure being um, prioritized and also investments. It could be private, it could be national, of course it could be multilateral, but that has to be a focus. And along with that, the human resources. Um, so it's the youngest continent, lots of opportunities for brains to be trained. Um, and I, I think we we have to acknowledge that overseas investments have to go hand in hand with the same investors investing in long-term human resources. I don't think um, lots of private sector, um, I mean, this will take 10, 15 years to build and a much stronger knowledge base, but they have to be part of the solution because, because a lot of the knowledge um, is within the private sector and they have to pair with government investments in that infrastructure. So not government or private on their own, but a joint investment into building uh, knowledge centers in Africa. And we have seen that during the pandemic, we have seen super interesting initiatives that come out of Africa uh, from earlier investments in partnerships, but, but we simply also have to have much more investment in advanced uh, knowledge centers as we have seen it in software, we have seen it in some other technology sectors, but it has to be much wider. Um, so not importing from around the world, developing in Africa and facilitating that move would be a major development effort and contribution globally. And as you said, um, the reference to the pandemic also points to what this, you know, epidemiological um, competence is even greater, um, infrastructure for full genome sequencing, much more advanced uh, vaccine production infrastructure and so on. I, that's, that's where we should see um, Africa going, not support just, but building their own knowledge base, their own capacity in, in solution development, which is already there across a number of excellent institutions in Africa. We just need even more across even more sectors. Anyway, that's all I had <laughs> to point out. And that, thank you for the opportunity. Well, that was rather important, I would say. I mean, stressing the knowledge uh, cooperation here and the knowledge uh, partnership. Thank you very much. Uh, we move on. When Fleming was speaking, I was reminded of an African proverb I learned when I was uh, Minister Denmark's Minister of, of Climate Change. Rain does not fall on one roof alone. I think that clearly sort of says something about the, the partnership. And I'm sure that's also a proverb that our next speaker can relate to because our ne next speaker is Birgitte Kvist-Sansen. And uh, Birgitte is the General Secretary at the Dan Church Aid Organization. You have been very active in many sort of debates on EU Africa, on the overall development, pandemic and so forth. So what's your take on debate? Where do you see 
hopes, dreams with regards to also Denmark stepping up its engagement with, with, through the European Union. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lugge. Uh, yeah, I think I think initially there's a little bit of repair to do because of the COVID pandemic. I think it was Guterres that said we're in a stormy sea, but it appears that some are sailing in yachts and others are clinging to a raft. And I think that's a, a, a picture that is being recognized on the African continent. So um, uh, back to what actually Birgitte Magusen said, I think it's important to find a shared vision. What is the vision? What is it uh, that we want to do together? Uh, and from a, a development uh, perspective, uh, I think I think it's immensely important that we have a united EU. That that uh, that we can see that on the ground. And uh, when we work in Africa, the fact that the EU um, have uh, sort of a, a joint vision mission. I know that the member states don't always agree on everything, but I think it's important to actually stand here together and say, OK, what is the shared vision? And 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 if we should uh, offer some suggestions, uh, I think it would be very much around what actually also Fleming talked about and uh, Guamaca talked about that that we need to find out what is it we want from each other. And I think what we have learned is that our role uh, as a development actor is not to come and do and tell. Our role is to connect the dots. There's a huge uh, pool of innovation, of youth, uh, of ways to do things that, that needs the investments, that needs the backing of the technology, I think. Mobile technology uh, is essential, needs to be developed. I also think if we go back to in the Danish setting, we have a lot to offer on, on a green tra transition, on adaptation, on mitigation. But if it's not owned by uh, the African countries, if it's not owned by the people, then it's, uh, it's not really working. So I think really, our role and in general the role of the EU is to be uh, facilitating uh, these initiatives and now also moving into to finance and in investments. I think if if an organization like us are able to point at, at uh, bankable initiatives, bankable uh, projects, then we, we will find the finance. Actually, it's not very difficult for us to link up financial institutions with uh, local manufacturing or markets. Uh, so, so I think maybe it's a bit of a myth to think that investors are, are not risk willing enough to invest, but of course they need a guarantee to see does this work and hear us as an organization and others they can uh, become the brokers. And I think that EU and Denmark can also become the brokers because uh, the EU and Denmark also comes in with a substantial amount of risk willing funding. Development aid is, is develop its grants. So there you have the risk willing funding. And I think we have to be more clever in looking at again, how can we facilitate the coordination of all these various instruments and and also and be very transparent in when is it we use the instruments and for what i think some of the confusion some of the maybe uh, the issues we have currently and geopolitics is because we're not transparent about what it is we want to do. Do we want when do we want to win hearts and minds or do we want to ensure cooperation and development uh, between two continents where of course there's power structure and it's uneven but I actually think that we have something uh, to give each other. I mean the innovation in our work is not happening in Denmark. It's happening in Africa and it's not us being very well educated in Denmark that thinks about it. It's the young people in Africa that thinks about it. So I think we have a lot to to give each other. So uh, really um, 
the green the transition i think is really good but don't think that we can just export our solutions i think the whole tech part is is really really important um infrastructure maybe china sits on a lot of that so uh, maybe we should focus on what work we're good at and, and and i said we 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 know something about technology we know something about green transition but we have to do it in in uh, partnerships or we have to just actually uh, realize that maybe we're the facilitators in this so that would be my kind of ask if i could have any in these negotiations Excellent. Thank you very much also for reminding us of the need to have some repairment done to the old relationship, particularly due to the pandemic. And you also mentioned youth, and that is definitely the cue for the next uh, sort of speaker and the next topic, uh, because uh, now we go to Mr. Koro, who works for Grundfos uh, Water uh, Management. And Macron, two weeks ago, the French president said the following, we need an education, health and climate agenda for the continent's development and in order to give hope to Africa's young people. You can obviously not speak on behalf of an entire continent, but you can speak on behalf of yourself. So what are your hopes for the future if you look upon the EU-African relationship? Over to you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Fris. Uh, this is a very broad topic. But I'll try and uh, put my thoughts together within a three minutes. Um, uh, we have to know that Africa is a land of many diverse orientations. I mean, politically, geographically, economically, uh, traditionally, and even socially. And the African youth, as we need to do, is more refined and resilient in so many spheres than a lot of people think. Um, because of all these economic, political, and social conditions that we found ourselves over the years, um, we have become so resilient that what other people see as fears, we do not see as fears again, we see them as um, challenges. So I can tell you that the African has no fears, if I can put it that way, um, because of all the things we've gone through. Um, so when it comes to fears, no, we'll call them challenges. Now, um, well, you said I can speak on my own behalf, but when the invitation came, because Africa is so wide, I decided to speak to other colleagues from different spheres to find out their thoughts and how they feel about this. And it is so interesting. Uh, one of them just texted me that after hearing, um, um, uh, is it Fleming? Yeah, speaking from Berlin, what came to his mind is the Berlin conference in 1885. Uh, he's asking me, are they going to share Africa again? Um, then quickly said, well, now times have changed. So this is going to, we are going to chart a new path, not as before, but a new path for uh, cooperation, for partnership, for that's going to be mutually beneficial uh, than we used to see. Something that went across, or I saw in almost all respondents that I spoke to was unemployment, uh, or let's call it underemployment. So it appears that in Africa, the harder you work, the poorer you become, right? Um, Africa currently has about 60% of its population under 25. And there are projections that uh, by 2030, 42% of um, the world youth will be in Africa. Now, these need to really work and take care of the upper limit, that's the elder generation, and then the lower limit. Now, this is something we think this relationship can take advantage of. Uh, when you come to Ghana, for example, the youth, some cannot pay rent and afford to eat decent meals because of this underemployment. They definitely find stuff to do, but they are not really sufficient. So this is one of the challenges that everyone really talks about. Um, we also have political stability. When you look at what is happening, especially in, in West Africa, uh, with young population being ruled by the older generation. There's a bit of mismatch in ideologies, the way we see things, the way we understand things, and this is bringing a lot of agitations um, in the sub-regions. Uh, we can mention our Burkina Faso, Mali, Gilni, and the rest, and which keeps spreading across. Now, what, what they also said is the media. So sometimes you hear of this news, and then so close to you, you get to the situation, you realize that it is not as exactly as the media is portraying. 
Uh, this is also a challenge uh, we see. And then the fear of being left out. So one shared with me that, um, am I sure that the way there's attention on COVID-19, how come there was no attention when Ebola came? Is it because now the big boys are also part? Uh, so when it has to do with only Africa, okay, let's leave them alone. When it has to do with the world, okay, let's come together. And now that we are looking at new partnerships, I think we need to look at all this because over the years, this has the raided trust and we need to build trust. Um, one thing worth noting is the African youth do not really trust its leaders so much as people think, uh, because we think they've taken some bad decisions on our behalf. That's why the continent is as it is now. Um, so one of the hopes we see is in this new cooperation, um, after the high level meetings and uh, the policy makers, uh, we need to find ways and go to the grassroots uh, where lives are being affected uh, directly, uh, which is very important. So we want or need partnership in trust. The trust is very, very important, and we need to find a way to get to uh, the grassroots directly. Now, we also want to talk about equal opportunities. Growing up, um, when we're doing sports, we're told that, especially boxing, when your opponent is not an African, the only way to win is to give the person a knockdown. Because it was believed that if it's not a knock knockout, you knock the person out completely. It is believed that the rules may go against you. <laughs> so growing up, yes. So those are some of the thoughts that run through the African young person. So he knows that he's already disadvantaged. So what must I do too? Um, so going forward, I think those are some of the things we need to really look at and, and then correct in the African youth. Now I have to say that there's a lot of prospect and um, on the continent we can look out for. Um, mm. As I said, a lot of the youthful population is in Africa and huge opportunities are here for investing in human development. And this population will need to work, which is something Europe can really take advantage of. Of course, you can bring some of the factories here. You have labor, uh, which will be cheaper than you have in Europe. Um, and we also want to the partnership to uh, be kind of co-creating solutions for the African. Not we want to be part of the decision uh, at a point. Uh, not only the consumer, the end product, but throughout the process. So we feel like okay, this is our product, this is our solution. We did it together. Not to be done and then brought. To, we want to feel some kind of ownership with it. Uh, so we can also uh, look at that. Then the. Strong, resilient, and independent institutions. Uh, you have worked in Africa, and you will know how difficult it is sometimes to pass through our institutions. Uh, we need to find a way out and make sure our independent institutions are independent of political interference. I've already told you that we do not trust our leaders so much. So anything that passes through the leaders, um, well, it is good. You can't do without them as well. But you have to keep at the back of your mind that we need to go a step further. Of course, I've seen organizations already doing that, uh, going a step further, not only at policy level, but going to do impact investment now, like uh, Pierre mentioned with the Ghana Water Initiative, a special initiative that Stromfors is trying to do good and do business. Um, there's data that about one third of treated water that goes through the pipes, or one third is lost through pipe fittings and weakening infrastructure and stuff like that. There's also another data showing that one third of people in Africa lack access to water. So that tells you that the solutions are right in front of it. They are not really far. These are some of the initiatives um, from force at the time actually even to take the front rule uh, and show the way for others to follow. Um, and this is part of a strategy. So private companies are beginning to see this as a holistic approach and to put it in their strategy. And if you listen to uh, Pierre very well, yeah, the human impact assessment is as expensive as cost of building some of the systems. So it becomes a chicken and egg uh, situation. Uh, how do you marry the two? Um, so I think the EU can look at supporting these companies who are already doing good um, because we, our relationship with uh, Europe is diverse. Uh, some are actually on the positive side, some are actually on the negative side. Uh, so this is one of the positive. Let me 
before I end, let me just give one of the negative side to you. So it is projected that African continent is the fastest growing, right? Uh, but on the ground, we do not see that ourselves. Yes, how how come? I mean, all the statistics show that it's the fastest growing continent. Yes, joblessness is increasing. Um, why is it? Why is it so? So, when the construction, especially um, maybe our friends from the Far East and Asia, sometimes they bring even painters. So you see a lot of liquidity, a lot of money in the system, but it doesn't benefit the African youth uh, directly. Uh, so you, that is how come you see that okay, the growth is on the is within the positive uh, gradient, but it is not reflecting uh, in our pocket and our living conditions. Um, so those are my few words, not to spend too much. There's a lot actually we can say, uh, but for three minutes, uh, thank you. Well done, and in particularly also uh, thank you very much for taking the effort of, of talking to, to friends and colleagues in your own preparation uh, for, for this session. We, we truly appreciate that. We could uh, go on for, for quite some time, but uh, being half German, I always like to stick to time, so Ordnung will sign. But uh, before I close, I would like to give the floor to our co-host, to the... Uh, uh, Paul Du Jensen Grundfos Foundation to the CEO, uh, Kipner Skipstad. So over to you for a farewell remark and some reflections. The floor is yours. And you are not in Addis Ababa. No, no, I'm, I'm in Bjergbo, Denmark. Yeah. So, so okay. <laughs> thank, thank you all. And, and, and especially also, I'd like to say a greeting to my very good friend, Hual Ali in Ghana. Uh, that was very interesting. And, and thank you also for the panels uh, during this session. It's been very insightful and, uh, and very inspirational. Thank you to the minister also for uh, sharing his reflections and not least the ambitions on behalf of the Danish government, what they're trying to do with the, the European Union uh, regarding uh, Africa. The reason why we are funding this uh, event and why we're interested in this is because the Grundfos Foundation has been active in Africa for many years and uh, in, in various projects where we've been donating money for especially water projects. And, and we've seen what also some of the Danes responded to, to the survey that, uh, that you showed us, was that, that um, we are a bit, well, frustrated about uh, some of our Asian friends investing heavily in Africa and seeing how the infrastructure in Africa is built by especially Chinese companies. And, and when traveling in Africa and you talk to your African friends and ask them what is really the need from, and help and tools you could would like us to come with, the answer is not a new uh, railway or a new uh, domestic uh, terminal for a, uh, an airport. It's really clean water, it's green energy, and it is, it's investments in, in local jobs. So that's that's the agenda also from our, my side, and, and I also heard that during today's session that there was some of the the key uh, highlights uh, during the the session, and also the idea of coming together in Europe, uh, especially Denmark is very keen on doing something in Africa to not just aid but make trade and develop the country the countries in Africa on their terms, not on our terms. And if you want to respect and trust, you have to earn it. So, so we have a lot of political signals that are very good, but the private sector are the ones that really can go in and, and do some action and, and put some money into it. So that has been very insp inspirational. Uh, our hope is, of course, due, uh, during today that we have new insights, new knowledge, and not least uh, inspiration, so we can uh, continue that dialogue uh, within the European Union together with the public uh, uh, private partnerships and not least with our friends uh, in, in Africa. So thank you so much, uh, all of you. It's been uh, fascinating and, and very uh, insightful. So, so I'm, to be honest, I'm, I'm quite optimistic because today I became even wiser than I was yesterday. So thank you so much. <laughs> that sometimes does happen. So exactly. thank you very much to you and thank you to all our participants, particularly also our panel. We could have continued for a long time, but we will return because uh, I think it was Nelson Mandela who once said, after climbing a great hill, 
one only finds that there are many more mountains to climb. And I think we've only scratched the surface. We still have a couple of mountains to climb to, and topics to discuss. And the next topic that we will discuss at this format will be water. So basically focus upon what can be sort of the cooperation there between the European Union and Africa using water as a specific case study. So could, we'll return with that, but we will obviously also make sure, as Katarina Sørensen mentioned, to, to follow the EU-African summit as it actually evolves. We got some insights there from all our panelists. And uh, personally, I'll be very interested to see how do they actually get these roundtables to work with the heads of states and so forth. Uh, will that create a different kind of dynamic, having experience of climate change negotiations myself? Goodness, there were many speeches and they weren't banned. So let's see how this works. It could actually lead to, to this new optimism that also uh, keep uh, mentioned at the end. Let's hope for that. And thank you very much also for the comments. There were many, as you can see afterwards, also links there uh, that my wonderful junior analyst, William, has been putting out there. So there are many things to follow up on as well. So thank you very much and uh, see you soon and um, stay negative, as they say. <laughs>